ninja teching has arrived on the scene. All right, let me tell you, these last few weeks have been crazy. I know, right? Luffy's going into his gear fifth. We're learning stuff about the Gumu Gumu no Mi. We got scenes with the Gorose. We got scenes with Kaido. We got scenes with Zunisha talking about Joy Boy. All this stuff. But let me tell you, this is the chapter where Oda drops the bomb. And that bomb is a five-letter word, R-A-I-Z-O, RIZO. That's right. We are finally bringing in the big guns to this fight to finish off Kaido once and for all, all right? I was talking about it in the last review. I was talking about how, you know what? I kind of like how Oda did not just depict Gear 5th as something that could just, like, curb stomp Kaido in, like, one chapter and call it a day. No, it is still a really tough fight for Luffy, and it's not even a guarantee that Luffy's even going to be able to beat Kaido. He's still got a lot of strength left, all right? So so that's why Oda is like, look, okay, Luffy got his awakening, he got his gear fifth, we can explore that later on down the line. For right now, Kaido needs to be defeated, and there's only one man for the job. So yes, this will be One Piece Chapter 1046 review, just titled Rizo. That's all you need! That's all you need, people! 1,045 chapters before this, almost 25 years of this story is all culminating at this one moment, all right? So grab your popcorn. Let's do this, all right? First, we start off with the cover serial of the Germa Double Sixes Emotionless Excursion, of course. This one, we actually do not see what's going on with Niji and Yonji in Big Mom's Torture Dungeon. No, instead, we cut back to Kakao Island, where two mysterious silhouettes have arrived. Ooh! It actually, dude, this brought back so many Bleach flashbacks for me. Because how many chapters of Bleach ended with, like, a mysterious foot, like, arriving? on the scene, right? I remember it happened with Don Kanonji during the fight with Aizen at Fake Karakura, but uh -oh, Kubo did that stuff a lot. Oda doesn't do it that much, but he did it here, all right? So we have um, one of the dudes there, I think was one of like, um, I don't know if that dude was like the police officer that like talked to Luffy when Luffy and Chopper were like devouring the town's chocolate, but there's a dude there that looks rather like important and he looks up and he has an exclamation point over his head and everybody else in town is just running away. Like, they see these two individuals arrive, and they're instantly like, well, we're getting out of here. Now, the first thing I want to say, and you know who they probably are, is because it's a title series about the Germa, is that this is Reiju and this is Ichiji arriving back at Kakao Island to rescue, you know, uh, Yonji and Niji, who have been taken to Whole Cake Island, but they don't know that yet. The only thing to bring up there is that um, th we only see their feet, or rather their shoes, in silhouette, and also they seem to be wearing capes, so therefore you would assume they are the Germa, right? How However, I would say that the um, the boots of the Germa raid suits have those little bubble things on the bottom of them because that enables them to fly and like levitate and do all that kind of stuff. These look like regular shoes. Now, Oda might just be playing around with the silhouette, so it very well could be. Um, there, there are different shoes. If you look at the individual on the right and then the individual on the left, they look different. So the one on the right looks like, I don't know, a typical like loafer or something, and the one on the left is a little bit higher up. It could be like a heel, so that could be Raiju, right? It could be, um, but they might not be in their raid suits right now, but they have their capes on, which they do have an outfit that they were wearing at the wedding that had a cape, so they might have just showed up. Um, I was also thinking maybe on the off chance this isn't the, the Germa, who else could they be? Um, they might actually be members of Blackbeard's crew, just because Blackbeard, you know, you know, with Big Mom out of town and everything might be like, Zay ha ha ha, let's take over all of Totland in the meantime. That's a popular theory. I doubt that Oda would do something like that in the middle of a cover series about the Germa. So I'm like 99% sure this is Ichiji and Reiju arriving, and that's why everybody's running away. Um, and they're just not in their raid suits yet, and they're going to activate them later. But uh, yeah, so I just wanted to bring that up. Rather interesting little uh, little cliffhanger Oda is leaving us off on there. All right, so we continue the fight between Luffy and Kaido. All right, the chapter is called Rizo. Don't worry, we'll get to 
him, okay? So we start off, Luffy ended the last chapter by punching Kaido square in the face. He does have the ability to uh, manipulate other people's bodies the same as he can manipulate his own body as rubber. I'm assuming that the person has to be at least within like a certain range of Luffy. Um, it might have to be with like physical contact, like the person's body only turns to rubber if Luffy is actively touching them while he's doing that. Uh, but it also might be just a range of effect, you know, like when Luffy's head got knocked down through the roof of Onigashima and like everybody on the festival stage, like their eyes were popping out of their head in response to that. That might not be comedic effect. That might be actually the effect of his devil fruit power. Who knows, right? Um, you, you really can't tell at this point with Odie. You just never know, right? So at any rate, um, Luffy, after punching Kaido, Kaido's on the ground and he's just like, ugh. And then Luffy is just bouncing up and down on the roof as a trampoline, the same as he always was. He's such a carefree, like, warrior right now. A warrior of liberation, as it were, right? Whereas after every big high-octane attack, he's still just bouncing around. Even though it ended last chapter, like, his awakening, you know, turned off and he went back to being, like, exhausted. And he had that epic speech where he's like, do you think death could scare me at this point? And then he went back into Gear 5th. Even though, like, logically, he should be, like, you know, dealing as much damage. Like, okay, we knocked Kaido down. All right, Luffy, just rain blows on him. You know, use everything in your repertoire. Use everything you got in Gear 5th finish this guy off as fast as possible, I think it might be because the state of Gear 5 is actually changing Luffy's, like, not his personality of, like, who he is, but, like, his, like, like I said before many times, he's, like, in a state of euphoria, or he's, like, in a sugar rush right now or something, where that is going to change his judgment on things, right? So after, even though he's like, oh my god, I'm so exhausted after going into Gear 5, he went back into it again. He's like, I'm gonna finish you off, Kaido! Let's go! Bam! All right, he's down. I'm gonna give him a couple of seconds. I'm just gonna be bouncing up on this trampoline until he gets back up, right? Also, something I thought that Oda was going to do with this, when Kaido got knocked on his, uh, his back last time, you actually saw some of his horns get stuck in the roof. I thought it would be funny if Kaido, like, tries to get back up and his head was, like, stuck in the ground. He's like, straw hat, I'm gonna... Oh, damn it. Oh, <laughs> he has to go back into his regular form in order to get back up. That would be kind of funny, but no, he doesn't do anything with that. So Kaido gets up, and he's holding his face, and he's just like, what? What just happened? You know, it felt like my face got like, you know, um, you know, like concave into my skull, and then back the other side, and then bounced back, like just happened to me, right? So he looks over at Luffy, and uh, Luffy, by the way, while he's bouncing up and down, is like, that last attack, I think I'm gonna call Gamu Gamu No, um... Huh, I don't know, actually. See, that's the thing. I think there's, like, so much, like, Luffy's brain is, like, so hopped up on Gear 5th right now, he can't even really think straight. So he's like, Gamu Gamu No! I don't know, big giant fist or something, I don't know. And so Kaido just gets back up and he's like, ugh, all right, let me just ask you one question. Just one. I, I have about 35, but let's just narrow it down to one for right now, okay? Who the hell are you? And Luffy just kind of like the question mark just appears over him and Luffy's just like, hmm? You know, this is very interesting to me because I think Kaido at this moment has realized this is actually Joy Boy. You know, Kaido has spent his entire life maybe wanting to become Joy Boy, and then after maybe he realized he could never achieve that, um, he could never bear the title of Joy Boy, he decided to become the gatekeeper, right? And so this is an opponent unlike any other that Kaido has faced. And so he has all these crazy powers, and Kaido actually starts to seriously think, holy crap, you know, the person that I have sought for so many years, my entire life pretty much, might very well be right in front of me. And so, maybe Kaido thinks that, like, with this change, Luffy has become Joy Boy, and Luffy will actually announce himself as such. Now, Luffy does not have any such memories. You know, Luffy's not just like, yes, I have the power of Joy Boy, you know, nothing like that. Kinda like Kaido was half expecting for, like, Luffy to answer, you know, like, who the hell are you? Luffy would be like, I am the one and only Joy Boy, you know? And Kaido was like, oh! 
It's you! I want your autograph! <laughs> you know, like, yeah, Luffy, like, like, maybe Kaido was thinking Luffy would respond like that, but he doesn't because he has no idea about any of that stuff, right? But we do cut back to Zunisha, and Zunisha kind of expands a little bit more about what's going on here. Zunisha says, oh yes, that rhythm of that drum beat, it's so nostalgic. Hey, Joy Boy, it's as if you're right here, right? How exhilarating. It all feels, I can't help but just think we should give faith in this boy indicating Luffy, okay? So even Zunisha is aware that, like, this is not the Joy Boy that, you know, I was friends with back during the Void Century, right? Like, like Zunisha admits this. Like, Zunisha's an intelligent enough being to know, like, the Joy Boy that lived in the Void Century is most likely dead at this point. I mean, I guess we don't know 100% that Joy Boy is dead or the circumstances leading to that, but we can assume that, you know, in 800 years, Joy Boy is probably dead at this point, right? Um, or at the very least, you know, this is not that person, right? Zun Zunisha admits this and is just like, okay, we can trust this person. We can put our faith and trust in Luffy to become the next Joy Boy, so to speak. At least that's the way I took it. So now we cut back over to Luffy and Kaido, and in response to Kaido's question of, who the hell even are you? Luffy's just like, hmm? Well, me? I'm Monkey D. Luffy, and I'm the man that's gonna surpass you and become king of the pirates! So, the same basic, you know, Kaizoko Oni Orewanara speech that Luffy has done about 37,000 times throughout this story, but now he's just a lot more energized to do it. Also, I just want to mention a, a side thing here. So, we have a close-up view of Luffy's face, and he looks he's still smiling, he just looks a lot more serious. He's just like, I'm gonna be king of the pirates, right? So we have this scene here, and there's a sim similar scene to this, I think, in the last chapter, or one of the last ones where it was like a close-up of Luffy's face. The art style has changed in Luffy's appearance while he's in Gear 5th a bit. Just the way that Oda is drawing and, like, inking it in is different. And I've actually saw some people complaining about this. Like, this is horrible. Look how Oda's art style has degraded. You know, he doesn't even care anymore. It's like... I'm pretty sure that's on purpose. Like, I'm pretty sure, like, whether or not you like the new style or not, I'm sure that that's intentional, right? Like, Kaido still looks the same as he always does. Luffy is drawn in a different way because he, his abilities are more cartoony and goofy, so it's going to be a little bit more of a different style than he's normally drawn in. At least that's, that's what I took away from this, yeah. So now we get a double page spread here where Kaido is there and he actually begins to explain what an awakening is to Luffy. He, the way that he explains it is like, we call this an awakening. It's the power of when your mind and body are finally able to harness the potential of your ability. So one way that he actually explains this is you kind of maybe lose yourself over to your devil fruit or you're, you lose yourself over to this power. It's like such a different experience. Like where where you and your devil fruit have like truly become like one entity beyond what it was before, right? And so you kind of lose yourself to this, and that might explain Luffy's like high that he's feeling right now, right? It might have been a similar experience like the first time that Kaido awakened to his dragon fruit. That also kind of explains like right then and there, that confirms Kaido is an awakened uh, devil fruit user. He's like, we call this an awakening. Lee, Kaido is definitely awakened. It might be something similar to that. Maybe not just with the, um, the sun god Nika fruit, it might be a situation where every single fruit, when you first awaken it, you feel like this rush of, like, euphoria, of like, this is incredible, I'm the strongest being ever, you know? And then maybe more when you get used to it, you can, like, acclimate to it a little bit more, but the first time you go into it, it's, like, crazy, right? And Kaido goes on to say, you know, what a ridiculous power that this is, you know, I've never seen anything like this before, and, um, he even kind of like, hey, listen, you know, you have actually taken a lot of stuff away from me during this battle, right? Like, I've lost so many of my soldiers, you know, my men fighting you guys, you know, pretty much all of my gifters have been swayed over to your side somehow. All the all-stars, all of the Toby Ropo, they're gone. Most of the headliners are gone. Yeah, I got some of the waiters and the pleasures left, but, pfft, you know, who cares, you know, really? My smile production has been destroyed because you defeated Doflamingo 
Flamingo. Like, I, my castle has been pretty much wrecked at this point. Um, and that's all because of you guys. You know, you've taken a lot of stuff away from me. Granted, at the end of this, Kaido says, well, I guess you've also lost a lot of stuff too, Straw Hat. I mean, there's a lot of your men and the samurai that have died here as well. And Luffy's just like, you know what? I'm going to take back everything that you stole. I don't even care that you lost all your men and your castle's, you know, gone or whatever. It's just like, you stole all this stuff from the samurai and the people of Wano, and it's because of you that, like, people like uh, Tama are going hungry, and it's just like, so it's that kind of stuff. I'm going to defeat you no matter what. So he charges at Kaido. Kaido takes out his Kanabo and uses Gundari Meteor Shower, which is basically like just him taking his Kanabo and then just like swinging it like crazy, just like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. You know, he's going into spray and pray with a Kana bow, but whatever, you know, it works, okay? So he's just doing that. He's slamming it into Luffy. Same thing like last time with Luffy's body basically molding to the shape of the Kana bow whenever he gets hit like silly putty. Luffy's just like boing and just like ah! And so he's getting hit all these different ways. Luffy then responds with, um, I guess, Gamu Gamu no Gatling. He doesn't really name these techniques at this point. He's kind of like moved beyond that. Maybe even that was an indication at the beginning of the chapter. Like he's like using these attacks without even thinking of names for them. Like naming them is not that important right now to Luffy. So he responds with like a Gatling maneuver, but his arms are moving in a much more fluent kind of like way, you know, in a much more cartoony fashion. So it's not like just straight Gatling what he normally does, right? So these uh, attacks like all snake around Kaido's Kanabo into his vital spots and like hit him. And the same thing, when these attacks hit Kaido, they transform parts of their uh, parts of his body that they hit into rubber so they get like bounced back and then I, I imagine the damage is like with the rubber bouncing back into Kaido that's doing like concussive damage against him right so they're doing a lot of damage to each other there Luffy begins to cough uh, not because he's about to like he's weakened or anything but because there's like actual amounts of smoke just billowing up from below because they've wrecked the roof at this point there's holes all over the roof this thing is getting ready to cave in any minute I'm assuming and uh smoke is just coming up from beneath and so Kaido is just like huh all right well um it seems that uh, the fire down below has gotten so bad it's reaching even here which means my entire castle is just gone so Kaido is just like oh man all right well after I'm done fighting you I'm gonna have to go and call my insurance guy you know uh, I, I do have the fire insurance policy I mean that's just responsible when you have a giant castle fortress right he's like I don't know if this covers rebellions I'm gonna have to look into my premiums and I, it's it's gonna be a mess Kaido is gonna be on the phone with his insurance insurance company all night, okay? So anyway, um, they mentioned like, hey, look, yeah, this fire's happening. All your men are trapped down there, Luffy. All of your friends, all of the members of your pirate crew, they're all gonna die down there. Aren't you worried about that? And Luffy's just like, <laughs> I left everything down below to them. Don't worry, they'll take care of it. And the fight resumes. So now, oh, oh, wait, actually, no. One final attack, and then we cut away. This is great, though. So Kaido lifts up his Kanabo. And he uses a technique called Devastating Gust. Now, we saw this before when he was in his dragon form, a few different ways. Like, he was able to, like, breathe those air blades, the one that sliced off Okiku's arm. Yeah, it's the same basic attack, except he's in his hybrid form, and he uses his Kanabo to just, like, swipe and then send um, a series. It, it might just be one of them, but, like, there's the way it's depicted. It looks like it's traveling forward. But it looks like he's sending, like, four or five of these wind blades, like, right at Luffy, right? Like, gets a a 10 shows or whatever. And then Luffy, the way he responds to this is like a cartoon character. He sees these giant straight lines of uh, razor blades heading toward him. He just lifts up his legs and just whoop, and then they travel right under his legs. So Luffy like literally grabs his package and is just whoop, and then whoop. That was a close one! It's just like, Kaido's just like, what even are you? Is this even a fight anymore? Alright. You know, so, um, yeah, that, that was pretty funny. That was pretty fun there. If nothing else, Oda is having a lot of fun drawing this. Okay. So now we cut below to the live floor, and sure enough, it is an entire, it's a disco inferno right now, right? Like the whole damn, we see an overview of the castle inside of the live stage and the first and second floors are like entirely bathed in fire. The third floor, there's like one little spot on the third floor that is not covered in fire. And then the fourth and fifth, but it's reaching all the way to the roof at this point because they saw the smoke up there where, you know, Luffy and Kaido were fighting, all right? So they're like, okay, 
the entire place is on fire, this place isn't even safe anymore, and we can't just leave because the ground is completely caved in, so there's like nothing now. It's just just the castle, the, the skull of Onigashima, and then it's floating barely, and there's no ground outside, and then the flames are just approaching inside. Chopper reunites with Nami, and it's just like, Nami, what's going on? Everything's on fire, and I can't find Zoro and Sanji, and I don't know what's going on, we're all gonna die. And Nami's like, that's not good. <laughs> I don't know where they are. That's not good at all. They mentioned to Zeus, so they're going over like every option they have to try to put out this fire. And they're like, Zeus, you're a storm cloud. Why don't you do it? And she's like, I thought you could make water out of the air. It's just like, there is no water in this air. <laughs> You know, like Zeus is basically like the Frozone line from The Incredibles. He's just like, what are you talking about? I do you know how do you know how storm clouds operate? Do you know how this works? I can't just make water out of nothing. You know what I mean? There has to be like moisture in the air, evaporation, condensation, precipitation. Do you not know the water cycle, right? This whole place is bathed in fire. There's like no moisture in here, okay? So Zeus can't save them. Zeus is just like, sorry guys, I can't do anything. So now we cut to the basement where we see um, actually a bunch of people approaching Brooke and Robin, and they think Brooke is, like, dead. Like, not dead. Yo, -ho 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 -ho, he is dead. But, like, they think that all of his skin is, like, burned off of his body at this point, and he's still somehow moving, and he's like, oh, my God, you look so beat up. You need to get out of here. He's just like, do you think I'm a burned corpse? You know, well, I guess I will be if I stay here any longer. Actually, no kidding, Brooke would probably be able to survive in these conditions way longer than most people, just because I imagine flesh and muscle would burn faster than bone. I imagine in order to burn bone, you would have to have a hotter flame, and, and the bones would have to stay in the flames for longer. So, um, yeah, I guess I guess the clothing that Brooke is wearing would burn off, but then he would just be a naked skeleton running through the entire castle. I guess he could survive a little bit longer than the average people, right? But they realize, you know, they need to get out of there, too. We cut over to Beppo. Beppo has, like, collapsed because he's a polar bear. You know, polar bear, not good with heat. You know, most minks are not good with heat anyway, because we saw that during the hot, hot sea with Pedro and Carrot, like they were about to pass out there. So uh, uh, Pe Beppo has passed out, and Sachi and Penguin and the rest of the heart pirates have to carry him out. And it's like, oh man, this is this is such a pain. I hope we can make it, right? Um, let's see what else here. Oh, we have a scene with Sanji and the the geishas and everybody uh, from the uh, the uh, brothel. Okay, so they're on the edge of the castle, and so Sanji and the and the group are trying to get out of the castle and go outside to the garden area. Remember, there was like that lake, that like pond that was right outside of uh, Black Maria's brothel. And so they're going to go there, I guess, but they look out a window and there's no garden. The garden is completely gone. So that whole area, like the scene with the tank and Big Mom like opened the screen and saw the tank there. Everybody else jumped in the water and she started chasing after Usopp and Chopper in the Brachio tank. Yeah, that bridge, that lake, all of that is gone. All right, it's just been collapsed, okay, entirely. Um, add that to the insurance claim. You know, that's going to be huge. So Sanji's like, oh, that's not good. We're not going to be able to get out of here this way. Oh no, what's going to happen? Now Sanji, here's the thing though, dude. Sanji has the power of Diablo Jambe. Actually, he has the power of Ifrit Jambe now. And I don't know if you guys know this, uh, it was revealed in the newest uh, Tonkoban, volume 102, that Ifrit Jambe actually has blue fire. So that's so cool. And there's like electricity coming off of it now. So that's the official color scheme of Ifrit Jambe. So I just love that. It goes from like regular like red fire to like blue fire. It's like he's Azula. I love it, okay? So but like Sanji, you, you fight fire with fire, right? Right? No, you don't fight fire with fire. You fight it with water. You idiot, right? There's a reason why firefighters don't like, hey, there's a third alarm fire in this building. All right, bring in the gasoline, boys. Let's light it even more on fire. That's how you put fire out, right? So, uh, oh, we have a scene in the basement with Apu and uh, Ebi, uh, who was the um, the number one number. Okay, the only one left because everybody else. Well, Fugo was fighting against number six. We don't know what happened to him, but he was allied with Yamato and then uh, Zanki number three was defeated by the CP0. So we have EB here, and uh, I guess Apu was just like, hey, EB, punch this wall so we can get out of here. And EB's like, okay, EB, EB. Boom! And he punches the wall, and it's nothing but like fire on the other side. So he like burns his hand, and he's just like, boom, EB, EB. And then, you know, Apu's there, and he's like, oh, it's just a minor burn. You know, come on, you wimp. Let's keep punching through the wall. So what if you lose an arm or a hand? You know, it's a, it's an easy price to pay to get out of here. You have that big body of yours. You might as well use it. Eevee's, like, looking at Apu, just like, Eevee, 
E-B, 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 E-B. Come on, man, do you want to fight, E-B? <laughs> so now we're just gonna have like a fight because he only says EB EB, but like you can understand a hundred percent. He's just like, I'm not taking what what you want me to sacrifice an arm so we can get out of here? What are you doing down here? Screw you, I don't take orders from you. That's pretty much what EB is saying. He looks pissed right now, okay? So we might have a little fight there between Apu and um and uh EB. So that's gonna be interesting there. Now we have a scene where we cut over with Usopp and Hamlet. Uh remember Hamlet is the giraffe smile that's under the control of Otama, and uh, he has uh, Okiku and Kinemon's body. They're trying to get away. Like, that was the whole point, right? So Usopp uses a new pop green to try to extinguish the fire so they can get through. He uses pop green sprinkler, which is like a little flower that sprouts up out of the pop green seed, and it operates like a lawn sprinkler. Like... He does that, but of course, because the whole area is bathed in fire, the flower just ignites, you know, just, he's like, sprinkler, now we can escape with the, f ah! and Hamlet's like, I mean, what did you think was going to happen there? And Usopp's like, just shut up, you know, I made a promise to Izo to get Kinemon and Okiku and everybody out of here safe. And Hamlet's like, could you include, could you include me in that too, please? You know, I, I'm also here. And he's like, yeah, whatever, you too, let's get out of here, okay? We see a scene with Frankie and Zoro, although Zoro is still unconscious, Zoro is like slung over Frankie's mighty shoulders and he's like carrying him out of there and he's just like, man, he really needs a doctor bad. I need to get to Chopper. I don't even know where I'm supposed to go. <laughs> even though Zoro is unconscious, his lack of direction is like affecting Frankie right now or Frankie has lost direction. I understand he's also running through a burning inferno where everything looks the same, but still, I like to think that it's Zoro's lack of direction that is also affecting Frankie in this instance, right? All right, so they're trying to get the hell out of there. They're trying to find Chopper. Now we cut over to the star of the chapter. Jinbei's there as well, but we see Raizo, okay? And Raizo, last time Jinbei ran into him, Raizo's like, you know, after his defeat of Fuku Rokuju, he's like, this is uh, the, the plan, the preparations have been complete. And we're all like, what preparations are you talking about? And so Raizo goes all the way to the end of a hallway, right? And, and remember, the hallway is on fire. It is currently burning. So they're like working on like a timetable here. So Raizo goes all the way to the end of the hallway. Jinbei's on the opposite end. So they're like a far distance, like a couple hundred meters from each other, right? They're just like way at the ends of this hallway. And, and then Jinbei's like, are you ready? And Raizo's like, yes, Jinbei, I'm ready. And just like, here we go, okay? Now this is brilliant. I love this. We now have a flashback with Ry from Raizo's perspective. He's remembering back when Odin Castle burned down right in front of him. And he witnessed, like, this is the castle of his lord just destroyed. And there was nothing he could do. And he uh, flashes back then to when they time jumped into the future and they arrived at Zo. And while they were on Zo, or while he was on Zo before Jack attacked, because there was a little bit of a time period there where, like, it was fine. Like, remember, uh, Raizo gets separated from Kinemon and Kanjiro, and then he ends up floating to Zo, and he stayed on Zo for a few days until Jack showed up and launched his attack, okay? So for those few days, Raizo was welcomed as, like, a member of the Kozuki family, and, like, thank you, and Inu Arashi and Nekamamushi were there, like, Raizo, it's been 20 years, how you doing? It's like, oh, you guys are still alive, this is crazy, right? So while he was staying there with the Minx, of course, Zunisha had uh, his daily bath where Zunisha would put his trunk into the ocean, you know, suck up a tremendous amount of water, and then launch it with the um, the eruption rain all over uh, Zo, the country, okay? And that's how they had like their aqueducts and everything and the filters. I imagine they would filter the salt out of the seawater and they would use that to like agriculture and like drinking water and stuff. Like that's where they got their water from Zunisha's daily bathing. And so Raizo, th this is great. Raizo Raizo is thinking like a D&D &D character here. I love this. Imagine if you were playing a character in D&D &D where you had Raizo's devil fruit power, where you can store anything you wanted in magic scrolls, all right? This is the kind of thing that you would be ingenious, right? It'd be like, wait a second. So you mean to tell me like, millions of gallons of water just rain down on this nation every single day? And Inorashi's like, yes, of course. And so Raizo immediately thinks back to Odin Castle. Now that was 20 years ago from this point, but from Raizo's perspective, that was only like last week that this happened, right? So he's like, oh my God, if only, if only that we would have this vast quantity of water 
at the ready, that would have saved Odin Castle. We would have saved everybody there. The castle would have not have burned down. This was such like, so he was probably kicking himself then, but he's like, hey, wait a second, Inurashi, can I take some of this water? And Inurashi's like, um, yes, I guess you can. I mean, we get more of it every day. It literally is coming from the ocean, so we're not exactly like running low on it, right? And so, Using the power of his Maki Maki no Mi, the scroll scroll fruit, Rizo stored a tremendous amount of water inside one of his scrolls and to use if he was ever in a situation again where he would have to like quench a massive fire. Now you might say to yourself, well that's a rather specific kind of situation, but you gotta look at it from Rizo's perspective. He's smart. He's like, I was in a moment where I could do nothing with this massive fire. I never want to be in this situation again. Even if the odds of it happening are one in a million, I never want to be caught with my pants down in this situation again, right? So Rizo is like, okay, let's do this. So he stores a crap ton of the water, like millions of gallons of water probably. Maybe not millions, maybe like thousands upon thousands of gallons of water inside. It might have been millions, from what we're going to see here in a second. Um, he might have just stored the water from one of the eruption rains or like half of it or something, right? Because it rains on Zoe every single day, you know, so whatever. So um, he takes out his scroll and he's like, you know, water style elephant's bath jutsu and then he releases it Psh, this giant pillar of water erupts at the end of the hallway heading straight for Jinbei and Jinbei knows what to do man he's like oh this is gonna be fun because I bet Jinbei is really like like he's dedicated to his friends and everything but I bet Jinbei is feeling pretty dehydrated right about now he's a fish man running around this burning building I'm sure he's like oh man I could go for a refreshing bath and a drink right about now right so this hits him and he's just like oh that's nice like you ever just have like this super hot day where you're just like the human Humidity is high and it's super hot and you're walking around and you're just like, oh my god. And then you have a nice, cool swimming pool and you just want to jump into the swimming pool, like that feeling, like, oh, that's probably what Jinbei is feeling right now. So this giant torrent of water, like, like Rizo just flipped up torrential tribute, just boom, hits Jinbei right head on. He's like, oh, that's nice. Okay. Water heart. Fishman jujutsu. Shoulder throw. Pfft. So it isn't just enough that Rizo has this water, the water also has to be directed. And that's where Jinbei comes in. So he takes this water and he throws it down to the lower floors, extinguished. Second floor, extinguished. First floor, extinguished, right? So he's guiding the water, he's a damn water bender. he can control it and everything like that, right? He's no Katara, but he's pretty close. All right, actually, Katara versus Jinbei crossover battle. Okay, Katara's got bloodbending, so that could really screw Jinbei up. Like, seriously, I don't think Jinbei can bloodbend, all right? And even his ability of waterbending is not as fluid as waterbenders from Avatar. I think Katara has a good chance of winning this. I, I'm not even kidding. I was like, no, she doesn't. One punch from Jinbei. Yeah, but... But is he going to get that close to her in order to do that? That's, hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm betting on Katara right now. I'm just saying. Okay. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So he takes the water. He throws it. Uh, we see some of the minks there. We see BB there. Um, and he's just like, who started these flames to begin with? Man, if I ever run into the guy that started this fire, I will rip his head off. You know, BB doesn't actually say that. But, you know, it's Orochi. So it's like everybody wants to rip his head off, right? So as he says that, the torrent of water now it's still a problem because you have a rushing flood happening in the center of this building so you could still get injured by that but this is the fastest and only way to put out the flames if they don't put out the flames everybody's gonna die so they have to okay so we see the water going all over the place uh, you know Rizo is there with the scroll still putting out the water by the way I made a video on Rizo's Maki Maki no Mi a couple months ago I think back in January it is kind of a broken ability when you think about it if he can literally store or anything in his scrolls and there's no time limit that was one of the things I was thinking about like is there a time limit because if there is like maybe he can only store something for 24 hours then that would be a weakness but apparently no he stored this vast quantity of water from Zoe like you know months ago from this perspective at this point and he was able just to use it whenever so holy shit right like he could just do that all over again I would just absorb as much water as you can is there anything stopping Rizo from just going up to the ocean and just storing like 
million gallons of water, scroll, scroll jutsu, another million gallons of water, scroll, scroll jutsu, another million gallons of water. Is there anything stopping him from just doing that? Because apparently he could, right? Uh, we see Killer getting dragged out of there. Killer has his mask all cracked from his fight with Hawkins, and he's like, fa, 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 guys, just don't, don't cause a trouble over me. And he's like, oh, sh stop it, Killer, we're getting you out of here. So they're dragging Killer away there, and then Killer sees, like, the water, we're saved! I could also go for a drink, I'm parched. You know, which this would be seawater, so, you know, I don't want to drink it, but still it works. So now we cut to the last scenes of the chapter. First is a scene with Yamato and Momonosuke, where Yamato is grabbing Momonosuke's like his whiskers as a dragon and she's just like Momonosuke it is time you need to create your own flame clouds and Momonosuke is like what I can't do that I was just controlling Kaido's and carrying it away it's like you don't understand the flame clouds are about to disappear it's it's almost over the entire island is beginning to fall it's happening right now you need to do this and Momonosuke is like ah so he's freaking out he's like wait a second I can't make my own flame clouds but I can just make a little bit so I can control Kaido's but now Kaido's are about to go away Way. So it's like the thing he's tethered to is going to disappear. It's like, oh no. So this is still a problem. I, I don't think it's as much of a problem as it used to be just because Luffy now has the ability to make anything around him super bouncy. So, you can kind of see where I'm going with this, you know, it's just like, oh no, Onigashima's falling, we're all gonna die! Gear fifth, bounce world! Boing! Onigashima just lands on the ground like it's a freaking bounce house, right? And then there you go, right? Um, so, and even, it, like, we cut to the inside, and Onigashima is beginning to tilt. Like, it's like, oh boy, Kaido can't hold it up anymore, that's a problem. So now, though, we cut to the last scene of the chapter, where, holy crap, the epicness of this last page cannot be properly articulated, okay? But I'm going to try, alright? So Luffy's there lying on the ground defeated, and there's nothing he can do. And Gear 5th has faded, so he's back to his exhausted form. And Kaido's looming over him, just like, ugh, stupid brat, I told you you wouldn't win. And he's right about to deal the finishing blow to Luffy, and Luffy's like, I can't move. That's when Raizo shows up behind Kaido, releases his, his uh, arm and leg weights, boom! Full power, Rizo! And then he proceeds to speed blitz the shit out of Kaido from every possible angle. He's just completely obliterated. And then one final punch, boom, into the ground. And then that's it, fight's over. Kaido is on the ground, defeated, knocked unconscious. And Rizo just stands over him and just cracks his knuckles and is just like, that's my ninja way. End of chapter. Okay, so, I mean, honestly, if that did happen, I'd be okay with it, but no, okay, what actually happens is maybe not as awesome as that, but it's still pretty awesome, okay, on the awesome meter, okay? So, last scene of the chapter for real. Uh, Luffy is looming over Kaido in the air. Like, he jumped up and he's, like, in the sky. I don't know if Luffy's in his giant form. I guess he could be because of the perspective. I don't think he is, though. But his whole body is, like, in silhouette. And you kind of see his face. Like, he's still smiling in the eyes. But then his whole body is just bathed in this, like, shadow. Because Luffy somehow is now holding a fucking lightning bolt in his right hand, like an actual lightning bolt. Like, you know how, like, a lightning bolt, like Zeus, like, in, like, mythology, you would see images of Zeus holding the lightning bolt and the lightning bolt shape and, like, throwing it? Yeah, that's what Luffy's got right now. He's got a lightning bolt in his arm, about to chuck it at Kaido's face. And then you just see, as Yamato is shouting over this, you know, Onigashima's about to fall, but then you just see a scene with Luffy smiling, about to chuck this lightning bolt at full strength, and Kaido is just staring at it, just smiling, like, <laughs> bring it on! You know, you think you're Zeus? You think you're the lightning god? You think you're Raijin, god of thunder and lightning? Bring it on, kid! You know, so Kaido is having a ball right now, but he's also really, he's reeling. He's about to, you know, pass out, just because the flame clouds are about to go too, right? So, um, where did Luffy get a, get a lightning bolt, guys? Where did he get one of those? I'm confused. Um, does Luffy's Devil Fruit now give him the- Oh, break next week, by the way. So yeah, that's why I thought the fight was gonna end here. I thought this was gonna be the last chapter of the fight. Oh no, oh no, no, we're not done yet. Fight's not over yet. Next time it might be, I don't know. But holy shit, and there's a color spread next time, so maybe the next chapter will be the final chapter. So, um, 
So does, does Luffy have the ability just to generate a lightning bolt? I'm assuming he can't. Um, so I'm assuming he just grabbed it out of the sky? Now, okay, now... I understand he's made of rubber, like, I get that, okay? And he's still made of rubber, or the concept of rubber. Every quality that rubber, like natural rubber has, Luffy has that, along with a few qualities that are not natural, that are like, you know, like, uh, like cartoony, right? Okay, but if you want to say that Luffy can literally grab lightning bolts out of the sky now, like, if a lightning bolt strikes and Luffy can just grab it as physical matter and then throw it at Kaido, Okay, that's awesome, but that, yeah, that is, that is straight up tune physics we're dealing with right there. I mean, yeah. Uh, also, though, but keep in mind, Luffy has used other techniques that involve electricity before. This is not the first time we've seen him do something. Well, okay, it's the first time we saw him pick up a damn lightning bolt and chuck it at somebody. But remember when he fought against Chin Zhao at Dressrosa, he used the Thor elephant gun, which I'm assuming was the power of static electricity. But I also assume the power of the Red Hawk was friction. So, pfft, you know, at this point, who knows? But if he's already able to use lightning abilities or like thunder or like static electricity, thunder, lightning abilities before this then I guess there is precedence for this. But still, like, did the lightning bolt just come out of his hands? Did Luffy just, like, lift up his arm and just, like, static electricity, tsh, lightning javelin, you know, gamu gamu no, Zeus's retribution, or something like that, because that would be cool. Or if it was a lightning bolt coming out of the sky, Luffy grabs it, maybe Eneru, you know, Eneru is descending back to the Earth, and he's using his mantra, his observation hockey, like, Luffy, I have returned. Eneru, what are you doing? I am here to defeat Kaido and I will help you. Here, take my lightning bolt. Right. Bam! <laughs> Eneru and Luffy combo attack. Um, you could honestly say either of those. Right now I'm assuming Lightning, uh, Lightning Luffy uh, generated that bolt by himself. I, I don't think he just grabbed one out of the sky. Also, when they go into Conqueror's Hockey, it's like black lightning, but it is a form of like electricity that's firing off them, so that might be an extent of that. Um, let me see, let me get a better look at this. Oh my god, it looks like it's coming off of, well... There's one lightning bolt that looks like it's coming from the sky. Now they look like they're coming from the sky. Yeah, because there's like three other lightning bolts that are behind him that are coming out of the clouds. And then there's Luffy holding one. So is Luffy summoning the clouds? He does have the clouds coming off of him like the ribbon. And it's a power of a freaking god at this point. So I guess Luffy's summoning clouds and controlling lightning is not really out of the realm of possibility at this point. You know what I mean? But, um, you know what? I'm not even going to try to explain it right now. This is awesome. This is an insanely awesome scene and panel. I want to get this made as a poster at some point. Like, I'm not even going to complain about it. You know what I mean? I'll think about it later and I'll make a follow-up video. But for just right now, Luffy... Like, stop thinking. Luffy's in gear fifth, holding a lightning bolt, about to shove it in Kaido's face. This is awesome, okay? All right, well, anyway, that was the chapter. Uh, I mean, Raizo was clearly the MVP, but Luffy with the lightning bolt. That was a good close second. Thanks for watching the review, everybody. Break next week. I think this is uh, next week, I actually think, is uh, Shonen Jump's break. And I think there's, like, another one for... Or it might be Oda's break next week, and then after that is the Shonen Jump break. I'm not really sure. Uh, but April's going to have a few breaks coming up, so just hold tight. It's going to be, like, two weeks now, and then Chapter 1047, and I think there's another two-week break after that. So just prepare yourselves for another One Piece drought. But uh, it's okay, because we got Raizo and his scrolls to uh, allow some hydration. Yeah. All right, I need to go get a drink myself because I'm very thirsty. Thanks for watching, everybody. Techig signing out. Rizo.